Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Bloomberg. I'm uh, president of ZapThink. We are a developed technologies company. Uh, ZapThink's been around for about a dozen years. Uh, industry analyst firm uh, became a training firm focusing on agile approaches to architecture. So we were talking about SOA when SOA was the hot topic, increasingly talking about enterprise architecture and cloud computing. Uh, acquired last year by Duvell Technologies, a US government contractor, but I'm still the guy who gets to travel the world speaking at conferences. Everybody else is stuck in DC, so they're all jealous I'm here. So uh, at ZapThink, in its 12 years of existence, has pretty, pretty much been focused on the enterprise, right? Big organization, uh, whether it's public or private sector. So now the US government is part of our focus, but we talk to enterprises all over the world. And we've talked to many, many different enterprises, and we found one universal truth. They're all completely screwed up. You might, if you work for a large organization, you might think your company is uniquely pathological, you know, but actually, in reality, uh, bureaucracy and uh, strange ways of spending money and making decisions. And of course, incompetent people throughout the organization are just uh, common to what it means to be an enterprise. So, but here we are in Silicon Valley at a technical show, so uh, my sense is that only some of you may actually work for a large organization. So how many people here work for uh, or consult for a software vendor? Oh, fewer than I thought. Okay, so maybe about 10%. How many of you work for or consult for what you might call a web company, a company whose business is really based on the internet? Okay, so how many of you would work for or consult for an enterprise, a large organization, public or private sector? Oh, how about that? Okay. So that's interesting. Maybe it's, uh, I, I misread the show, or maybe it's just that Zapdick attracts the enterprise people. I don't know. Either way, either way uh, here's, our, here's sort of how we view the enterprise, enterprise IT, the dark side. Okay, so most of you in the room sort of know what I'm talking about. So what do you have in enterprise IT? Well, you have legacy, right? Big, monolithic apps. Sometimes they're old, sometimes they're not, but they're big, they're expensive, difficult to, to, uh, to scale, difficult to work with. Uh, they tend to run in single partitions. They're not, you know, they, they run on big servers. And it's difficult to scale them. Uh, if you have a transactionality in a traditional database, right, the, the old world of SQL databases that are, have acid transactionality, uh, it can be very expensive. And they have a single point of control, which sort of goes without saying, right? If they're in a large organization in your IT shop, obviously you're going to control that application. So that's sort of the starting point. But what's happening in the world here is this whole picture is changing, and cloud computing in particular is, is basically forcing enterprises to rethink this, this dark side model. So let's take a look at your applications in the enterprise. So here you are. I don't know if you have one like this. Spaghetti code. Anybody hear me? Spaghetti code? Uh, you don't want to admit it, right? But there's a lot of it out there, right? So old, older applications, maybe old obsolete code, or code that's been tweaked over so many years by so many people, nobody really knows how it works. Or maybe you've lost the source code, or lost the documentation, or maybe there wasn't documentation, or maybe the documentation's all in Italian. That's all, that's all in, and nobody speaks Italian. That's happens, that happens too. So what we're going to do? We're going to take this and we're going to put it in the cloud. Right, that's going to fix all the problems. The CIO, I read about cloud in, in you know, Business Week or something. Oh, we've got to move it to the cloud. It's going to clean up all our legacy issues. It's going to run faster. It's going to be scalable. It's going to be elastic. OK, so here we are. Zap thinks secret technique for moving spaghetti code into the cloud. Ready? There we are. It's in the cloud. OK, well, unfortunately, there's more to it than that. That's really what this talk is about, right? You have to think about how that application is architected. Moving to the cloud requires more than just picking it up and sticking it somewhere, right? The cloud is not just some big server in the sky. You have to get into what's really going on to understand how we can do this. Okay, so let's say the problem isn't quite that bad. We have a modern distributed application written in Java, C Sharp, whatever, right? It uh, follows all the object-oriented best practices. So you might look at something like this. And now the CIO comes along and says, let's put that in the cloud. Okay, so how are we going to do that? There we are. Well, even with something like this, where it's not necessarily spaghetti code, it follows you know, modern programming best practices, you still have this problem. right? The problem is that the cloud requires you to consider certain architectural issues that uh, are unique to the cloud. Or not necessarily unique, but are, are um, uh, characteristic of the cloud. And of course, this talk being focused on, on uh, data, we're going to be focusing on that part of the story. Okay. 
So this is an important point, right? If you have existing applications in your legacy environment, your enterprise environment, and you're looking to move to the cloud for whatever reason, you want better elasticity, or you want a, a pay-as-you-go financial model for your infrastructure, or you want to leverage platform as a service tooling, whatever your motivations are, typically that's going to require you to rethink the architecture for your application. But the good news is you'll end up with a better architected application. Right? The principles that the cloud requires you to follow are, are good practices in general. And we'll see this as we go through a few of, the, a few of these. OK, so here's sort of a, what, why the cloud, why the cloud is, um, requires this level of architectural rethinking. So here's an app before the cloud, right? traditional distributed application. We have our three tiers, right? our persistence tier, our middle application tier, our, our presentation tier. OK, we know sort of how to deal with this, right? We know how to scale it, et cetera, and uh, deal with, with various issues. OK, what if, what if we want to move this into the cloud? Well, the problem here is we can put our persistence tier in the cloud, right? There's a number of cloud-based database vendors or other uh, vendors at the show, and they'll talk about how they can either give you cloud-based persistence services or maybe their applications or tooling running the cloud. But essentially, we have, it's elastic, right? We can scale this. Same with the application tier, right? We can put the application tier in the cloud. We can make that elastic. We can make that dynamically provision, uh, dynamically provision. So how many database instances or application instances do we have? Well, we don't know. It could change from day to day, minute to minute, hour to hour. And that requires a new way of thinking about uh, how we're going to architect those tiers. Of course, we're going to be focusing more on this tier and this time. So what are some of the challenges? Well, elasticity is perhaps the most important of the essential characteristics of the cloud. Right? When we say that we want the cloud to be elastic, it means whatever resource we're talking about, servers, storage, et cetera, can, we can dynamically provision them, and we can provision as much of that resource as we need in an automated way. And if we don't need that resource anymore, we can deprovision it in an equally rapid automated way. So this gives us a, a level of mystery, right? We don't know how many instances we're going to have because the number could change depending upon our capacity requirements. Uh, and uh, uh, right, and so it's, we have this notion of mystery, and we also have this illusion of infinite capacity. Right? If you always have enough capacity, even if you need more, you have this illusion that you have an infinite quantity. Well, we know there's no such thing as infinite capacity, right? But it's a cool illusion, and this is part of why we use the term cloud, is because it's cloudy, it's, it's infinitely large, but even though we really know it isn't, but, but that's the illusion that if we get elasticity right, that's what we get. Okay, scalability, right? The old way, the enterprise way, the traditional way is vertical scalability, right? If we want to make our Oracle database, we need to scale it, then we need to you know, add more big machines, right? And, and they all typically run in the same cluster. So we want to add more resources to individual boxes, works well for monolithic applications, and that's the way traditional enterprise apps that were architected. Of course, the new way, you hear about it, I've been at this show now a day and a half, it's like every single session talks about horizontal scalability, where it's scale out instead of scaling up. Adding commodity servers as opposed to buying very expensive servers, right? if you want to add more capacity, add more servers, so now your applications have to be able to run on multiple servers, where each individual box, the hardware might be uh, relatively less expensive, right? It may not be some very expensive piece of hardware. So you have to architect your applications accordingly. Okay, fault tolerance. Another uh, difference with the cloud, which if you think about it, really isn't that it's different. It's that the cloud shines new light onto fault tolerance best practices that we sort of like to keep in the dark before. Right. So the old way, how do we deal with fault tolerance? We want to have a highly available system. Well, we can do set up array disks, right? So redundant array of, independent, of uh, inexpensive disks. That's one way of you know, dealing with uh, hard drive failures. We can do mirroring, where we have uh, you know, two uh, databases that are maintained and you know, identical at all times. So if one goes down, we can switch to the other. And this can give us a level of high availability but essentially, it's within a single partition, right? We're basically doing it within the context of a single application environment. 
So the cloud way, well, we're not buying really expensive hardware. We have commodity hardware. It's all being hidden from view. We don't really care about the, the specifics of the hardware. And we're not expecting systems not to go down. Right? Commodity hardware is expected to fail. Right? If you're Amazon, you have how many servers do you have? Yeah. Hundreds of thousands. Right? They're failing all the time. Google, failing all the time. Right? So it's not a question of avoiding failure. It's a question of responding to failure in an automated way. Hard drives are going to fail. Servers are going to fail. Things are going to go belly up all the time. So you want to have an automated way of reacting to failure. So one of, if, you know, so if a box goes down, a new box comes up, or a new virtual machine instance, new storage instance, comes up and says, well, what do I, what am I? OK, here's what I am. Goes finds it. You know, what data should I have? It goes and finds it, hey, what should I be doing now? And figures out what it should be doing. And it can basically pick up where it left off in an automated way. So we want to be able to provide for a level of basic availability in the cloud where essentially any individual thing can go down, the overall application keeps working. And that's essentially what we mean by basic availability. OK, so this brings us to the cap theorem. Now, it's interesting. Uh, I'm talking about the cap theorem now for oh, about a year. And this, this is the first conference I've ever spoken at where I've heard other people actually talk about this. So this is, this is something I've seen three or four times in just the last two days. So, so you may have, you know, this, this crowd may be sort of familiar with it. I'm sort of getting the sense that this is becoming um, a more familiar topic uh, for data, you know, data people. I was at Enterprise Data World, and even there, not that many people had heard of it. So this is something that's definitely shifting in the marketplace. But essentially what the cap theorem says is that no distributed computing system can guarantee immediate consistency, basic availability, and partition tolerance all at the same time. You can have any two, but you have to give up a third one. So this can be a real challenge for an enterprise environment where they're uh, comfortable with traditional relational databases that essentially uh, guarantee consistency and availability, but run in a single partition. Right? They're not partition tolerant. The challenge with the cloud is we want to be highly available, or we want to have basic availability that is partition tolerance, which means we have to give up immediate consistency. And that is, that is a challenge that we have to deal with <coughs> in the cloud environment. So just to find these terms, basic availability essentially means that individual <coughs> parts of your um, infrastructure can fail, and the overall application will keep working. So every request receives a response about whether it was successful or failed. Right? So even if a box crashes, the overall application keeps working. So uh, th this is an important characteristic of the cloud. Right? Clearly, we wouldn't want to be in a cloud environment where we're not in control of the individual nodes, because that's our cloud provider to control of them. And if one of them goes down, our application crashes. Well, clearly, we want to avoid that. Partition tolerance, this one is the, it may be the one that is the least familiar. Essentially, when we say a system's partition tolerant, it means that the individual nodes can stop communicating with each other. There can be a network issue, um, and the overall application will keep working. Now, if a node just fails, then that's an example of it no longer communicating. So that's sort of included in this. But even if all the nodes are up and running, if there's some sort of communication issue where there's no way for these servers over here to communicate with those over there for a while, the overall application should keep working. So this is also a characteristic that we want from a cloud environment. But we don't want to be in a situation where the individual nodes in our, in our cloud infrastructure, uh, you know, some sort of network issue or whatever latency issue, we don't want that to bring down our application. Remember, if you're using a public cloud, for example, you have no visibility into that. So the last thing you want is for your application to stop working, and it turns out it was because there was some, you know, some you know, switch went down inside a data center somewhere. Well, obviously, that's an important consideration for you. Okay, so what about consistency? Now, consistency, this is, this is a tricky term, and it's even trickier than I thought it was 48 hours ago, <laughs> right? Because I learned a lot just in the last two days. There's many different flavors of consistency, and this can be uh, one of the tricky parts of the consistency story is there's a lot of theory, a lot of different types of consistency, and it can be very confusing. But we'll talk about a few different kinds here, not all of them, but a few different kinds. The first one we'll talk about is what 
It's traditionally called high availability consistency. So this is something that relation, traditional relational databases, right, the, the old SQL databases offer, right? That is essentially they can guarantee that all views of the data are always the same, right? That there's never going to be some user somewhere that sees, or two users that see different views of the data at the same time, right? And they can guarantee that. And there's a lot of stuff that has to go on under the covers in order to provide that guarantee. The challenge here is that it has to work within a single partition, right? So if you have multiple partitions, then there's no way this kind of uh, application can guarantee that kind of immediate consistency. So it says here the C in ACID. And actually, I learned a bit yesterday. There's a more to that, the consistency in the ACID uh, requirement for transactions, atomic, consistent, isolated, dur durable. When they say consistency, it means that uh, the, the, essentially all of the operations of the database maintain consistency, you know, triggers and uh, indices and all of that. But at, you can still definitely say that a traditional racial database should provide a level of con essentially immediate consistency where all views of the data <coughs> should all agree with each other at a point in time. Okay, so what about enforced consistency? With enforced consistency, essentially we're willing to give up basic availability because we want to be partition tolerant. So essentially we're saying that if our data are inconsistent at a point in time, oh, we'll just, we're not available until we clean up our act and we do some sort of synchronization step. Oh, okay, we're done, we're, we're consistent again. So you can guarantee consistency because if you're not consistent, the, the consumer of your data, whether it's the user or another application, has to wait until you are consistent. And that's one way to enforce consistency. So this in this situation is when consensus is important, right? where it's important that all your knowns have to agree with each other or your application cannot work properly, but it's okay if you have to wait around for however long it is, and we only milliseconds, until your data are uh, consistent. So then we have the notion of immediate versus eventual consistency. So immediate consistency, right, all nodes agree on the uh, same data at the same time. They all agree on the data at the same time. All nodes are always consistent with each other. Well, this is what we can't guarantee in an environment, that a distributed environment, that is partition tolerant and has basic availability. What we can give you is eventual consistency. So with eventual consistency, basically what we're saying is that the data may be stale. Right? Two different users might see different copies of the data, different views of the data at a particular point in time. Until such time as, a, as we can bring them back into consistency. So with enforced consistency, we say, oh, you know, we're out to lunch until we can fix this. With eventual consistency, we'll say, well, you can read our data, it just might, you, you might have to wait around for an update and, uh, or for a synchronization step. And sometimes that might only be a couple milliseconds later, so it may not be a big deal, but it's something you have to think about in the context of whether your application can support that. Okay, so eventual consistency, this is uh, sort of the, uh, the wrench in the works for a traditional enterprise uh, you, know, uh, you know, architect in the enterprise who's used to traditional systems. It's like, how could we ever have, uh, you know, an ERP system or, you know, our, our, you know, inventory system or whatever the enterprise app is if, you know, we have different views, you know, different, uh, you know, different versions of the truth at a point in time. There's just no way the boss would go for that, right? Well, in reality, eventual consistency has been with us since Babylonian times, right? It's been around for a long time. The Babylonians invented modern accounting, right? Uh, the uh, double entry accounting. Well, with double entry accounting, right, even if you're doing it on paper, even if you're doing it in clay tablets, you close the books at the end of every reporting period. So at the end of every month, you bring all your data into a consistent state. In the meantime, you may have inconsistent data, right? This account might not agree with that account because you haven't reconciled the books yet. So that's a familiar behavior even before we had computers where the periods of consistency might be a month, <laughs> right? Now it's down, we're arguing about milliseconds. Well, that's, a, that's what computers uh, bring to us. So eventual consistency is familiar for any, any process, any business process that has an out-of-band out settlement step. So even real-time stock trading, what perhaps the most time-sensitive process you might find in an enterprise, uh, even real-time stock trading has an end-of-day settlement. 
right? They keep track of all the trades during the day, and at the end of the day, they figure out where all the money goes, right? That's, that's uh, you know, those accounts may not be consistent during the day. Or mobile phone roaming, that's the same idea, right? The mobile phone providers have to reconcile all their accounts. That might take them a few days before, you know, one company knows how to build another company when you, uh, you know, took your phone to a different country. Okay. So if we can't have acid, we can't have that same kind of high availability, immediate consistency, then what can we have? Well, we can have base, right? So we're dropping acid and we're raising our pH, right? Going from acid to base. Now, I didn't make up these words. I don't know. It's like, there's some argument in the blogosphere. It's like, oh, it's sort of, a, you know, a, a lame kind of base thing. And how contrived is that? But actually, the acid acronym was contrived in the first place. So anyway, whatever. It wasn't my fault. I didn't make these up. Base has actually been around since before the cloud, right? Base has been around, you know, since the, you know, web 1.0 days. What does base stand for? Well, basic availability, soft state, and eventual consistency. So basic availability, right, the sort of availability we expect from the cloud, eventual consistency, stale data are okay some of the time, and then soft state. I haven't talked about soft state. So what's the deal with soft state? Well, soft state basically means that the state information any node has uh, about some, what's going on somewhere else might be out of date. So each node has to know to expire it after a certain amount of time. So if you work with caching mechanisms, this is a familiar behavior, right? Caches expire after a certain amount of time. But the example I like to use is instant messaging. Right? You have your instant messaging client, and your little smiley face means your buddy is available, right? But let's say your buddy uh, goes through a tunnel and drops off the network. Well, your buddy's phone wasn't able to send you uh, uh, an unavailable message, so your phone doesn't know that your buddy's not available. So you'll see a little smiley face for a while, even though they're not available. But of course, your phone is smart enough to know that if it doesn't get that information refreshed after a certain amount of time, then it's expired, right? And your buddy will go unavailable after a certain amount of time. So this is familiar behavior, right? Familiar behavior for any kind of caching mechanism or anything that uh, the communication between nodes isn't 100% reliable, which in the real world is a very common situation. It's sort of the enterprise context where we're assuming the network is always working is a bit artificial, right? The real world, it's not like that, right? In the real world, we can't always have communication between nodes, and that's essentially what it means to be partition tolerant, right? So there's always this trade-off uh, between partition tolerance, uh, high, you know, based on high availability, and uh, immediate consistency. So one of the requirements that eventual consistency gives you is that uh, your data may be inconsistent, you may have stale data, until such time as you can synchronize your data. So synchronization, but synchronization takes place after the fact, right? If you require synchronization before your data are available, that's enforced consistency. If your data aren't available all the time, right? So what we're talking about here is synchronizing out of band. You know, there may be a moment or two the data are out of sync. A moment or two might be milliseconds, depending upon your technology. Well, is this really that bad? Well, it's a familiar behavior again, right? If you've ever synced your phone's calendar with your desktop calendar, with your company's server calendar, right? It's a familiar behavior. Sometimes, you know, you make an appointment, stick it on your calendar, it might take a couple minutes for it to appear on your phone. Of course, if your phone's turned off, it will take longer than that, but it's a familiar behavior. So what some of the vendors at the show are talking about is because they work in a cloud environment, because they're horizontally scalable, they have to perform a synchronization step because they want to guarantee high availability. They have to give up eventual consistency, so they have to perform a synchronization or replication step, and then they're spending all their effort making that as fast and as, uh, as stable as possible. Other vendors are focusing on a different part of the story. Okay, so for the enterprise developer, the architect, you know, the enterprise application architect, you know, looking at your existing applications and saying, well, I want to move this to the cloud. I want it to be elastic, which means it has to be partition tolerant. So how do I deal with this requirement for eventual consistency? Are you ready for inconsistent data? That's the key question. So for example, let's take an inventory application. What do they do? Well, they keep track of how many widgets are in inventory, 
right? That's what they did, right? So two users query the database at one time. They might get different numbers. This is what eventual consistency is all about. So that could, could be a problem if somebody places an order for an item that they think is available, they pay their money, and then the system gives them an the error, says, sorry, we took your money, but we can't give you the product. You know, please call our customer service. Nobody wants that, right? <laughs> so what's the desired behavior? Well, I mean, it depends on, you have to think about it, right? One example might be, well, you get below a certain threshold, and you give the user a message saying, well, we'll attempt to reserve this product. We won't charge you a credit card until we can guarantee we'll be able to ship it to you. Five minutes later, they get an email saying, yes, you got your product, or sorry, it's out of stock, but your card is only charged if uh, they got the product. So what this means is if you have some legacy inventory application, you might have to make adjustments to the business logic in that application. And you're back to the spaghetti code. So that could be a challenge. But again, it depends on your situation. So it's not that these problems aren't resolvable. But the real point here is you have to think about what it will take to take some existing legacy app and put it in the cloud, and you have to think about what are the consistency issues that partition tolerance introduces, how I, what, what, are my, what are my priorities? The cap theorem is a theorem. It's mathematically proven. We can't get around it. What we can do, though, is we can move the priorities around. Right? So what are, what are our priorities? How am I going to make the consistency step more, more, more rapid? Or how much availability do I need? Or what? Those are the questions you have to ask. So to leverage the cloud, essentially, you have to think elastically. And we talked to a lot of different people, and this is perhaps the hardest part about really understanding what the cloud is all about. Right? You can't think of the cloud as just a virtual server or a virtual database, virtual storage. Right? You have to think about it as elastic versions of those things. Right? How many nodes there are that support that storage instance or that server instance or whatever it is can change over time, can go up and go down. Well, that impacts how you actually architect your application. So I don't know if you recognize this thing. The chaos monkey. So the example there is that's Netflix. I made it from Netflix. Oh, cool. So you know about the chaos monkey? Not from Netflix, no. Oh. OK, so it's a, it's a ringer. <laughs> well, anyway, Netflix has this thing they call the chaos monkey. Right? They're in a cloud environment. And they put together this, this you know, small, you know, small app that randomly kills processes and services in their production environment. Right? Keep them on the coast. Because right? the whole point is that the whole application, this overall Netflix application, has to stay up even if a random service, a random you know, process, random whatever, crashes and burns. So they actually put this in production. So can your legacy application environment withstand your chaos monkey? If not, it may not be fully ready with the cloud. Okay, so we went from the dark side to the light side. Now, of course, purists will say this is still the dark side because Luke has switched out the picture of you know, Anakin here. But anyway, that's a little Star Trek trivia there for you. But the light side, right? The world of web scale. Now, the challenge here, right? We have the enterprise context, and then we have the cloud. But the enterprise wants to do all this cloud stuff. And they're being forced, whether they like it or not, to think about things the way the world of web-based uh, applications have been working now for, what, 20 years, right? So Google, Amazon, eBay, all these companies have figured this stuff out. And now it's time for the enterprise to get with the program, right? They have to want to move to the cloud. They've got to figure out how to build and manage and architect apps that can take advantage of these best practices that the Ebays and Amazons of the world have figured out now for old generation. So hypermedia-based applications, not just web interfaces, but leveraging hypermedia to be, be the core of what your applications are, partition tolerance, based transactionality, resiliency, right? Something goes down, it comes back up. It should be a, a built-in capability of any application. And then no single point of control. Right? If you think about uh, you know, a lot of these app store based uh, applications, there are many different pieces that work together and the pieces are provided by different people. There's no single point of control. Well, that's, that's quite alien to the enterprise way of thinking. The last thing the enterprise wants is an application in their environment they don't control. Right? But that's a whole new way of thinking. So, to the poster. So if you didn't pick up the poster, there's a pile in the back. And 
I'll, if there's any extras, I'll leave them on the literature table after, the, uh, after I'm done here. So that's what, basically what we're talking about in the poster. Right? Our vision for enterprise IT in 2020, only seven and a half years away now, uh, basically, it's not just, oh, we're going to be service-oriented, or we're going to be in the cloud, or we're going to use mobile computing. But all those things and more, like many different trends that are interrelated, very complex web of changes that are coming, uh, or they're in progress. It's not just in the future. It's, we're in progress now. So this is a part of the story, right? And you know, when you hear this at this conference, it's all about whole new ways of thinking about dealing with information and about dealing with scalability and about providing business value and about building applications, right? Whole new uh, world that the enterprise is only sort of getting an idea that there's this whole new world out there. And they can move to a mobile environment, they can move to the cloud, they can be hypermedia driven. But it requires rethinking what it means to build applications and to deal with information. And it's just it's changing so many different factors. Uh, in the enterprise today. And so it's an exciting time. And it's, it's interesting to speak to different audiences because everybody sees it a different way. Right? If you're coming from, like you've been working at eBay for 20 years, you look at this and say, well, why would you do it any other way? Right? But if you've been working at some insurance company for 20 years, it's like, my boss will never go for that. Right? <laughs> it's a very different kind of perspective. All right, thank you very much. There's my contact information, my uh, Twitter, Twitter handle, everything. So how are we doing? Yeah, I have a little time for questions. Oh, come on, we got some questions. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Brian Slutton gave a really good rest talk yesterday. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, um, how does, is, is, are the restful principles part of what you're talking about here? Oh, I love, that's a whole separate talk. Yeah. So, that, those, them spike the words. What I'm finding, and I've been doing research on rest now for a number of years, is that most people completely misunderstand rest. Right, there's like two versions of rest. There's the version that Roy Fielding laid out in his dissertation, and there's a version that it seems like everybody seems to think rest is, but it's just not it. So I didn't go to this talk, so I didn't know which one he was. I don't know if he got it right or if he was got it wrong. So the common misconception is that rest is about APIs. Right? <laughs> that if you want to build, you have a uniform interface, you can create these restful APIs, and there's, some, there's a lot of value there. Right? And it's a key part of the story, you know, this uniform interface gives us an additional loose coupling that web services promise that we're going to deliver, and that's an important part of the story. But the way we see it, sort of coming from the architecture perspective, is REST is about building buildings, and APIs are the mortar for the bricks. And it's like, oh, I want to design this big building. I don't know how to do that, but I sure know how to make mortar. And you're missing the big picture. The big picture of REST is REST is for building distributed hypermedia applications, like the World Wide Web. Fielding looked at the web and said, this is cool, right? It's immense, nobody's in charge, it's enormously resilient, right? Has all these great properties, and wouldn't it be great if we could distill those properties to a set of core architectural principles, we could apply to a whole class of distributed applications. And that's what he was talking about when he talked about distributed hypermedia applications. So REST stands for representational state transfer, right? transferring application state to the client in the form of representations. That gets missed in a lot of discussions of REST. Uh, separating application and, application and resource state, where only the resource state gets stored in the persistence here. Application state is transferred to the client. And the point is that we're building distributed hypermedia applications where the API, the RESTful you know, Uniform Interface API, supports that. So this is all part of the story. And it also fits into the cloud story. Because we need to be able to scale the middle tier, we can't maintain state information. So we could put it in the database, but that introduces issues. Although, at least one of the vendors to show is addressing that issue. Can we maintain application state in the database? And how do we scale that? That's not a RESTful approach. It's an alternative approach. A RESTful approach is, well, let's maintain application state on the client. And what does that mean? Can we, and how do we support that? in the context of hypermedia application. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but I can just keep going about that topic. <laughs> it, it, it's several different uh, points that are worth considering. Yeah, it's, it's a whole talk in yeah. itself, yeah. Uh -huh. And I give that one at other conferences, but since this is a data-centric conference, you get the cap theorem one. <laughs> and I think you were asking how, how does REST 
um, relate to eventual consistency in some of those cloud models, right? Well, yeah, I and mean, I think he, uh, Jason was just pointing out that, that there, there are different approaches and the RESTful approach, if, if people can understand it and get to it, would seem to be the standard approach. Well, it's the web, the standard approach on the web. Yeah, right. But it's, it's unfamiliar in the context of enterprise apps, right? So we don't want to maintain state information here because we want this to be elastic, right? So if one of these goes down, we want to be able to replace it. So, and we could put it here, and some of the vendors at this show do very well because we have these, all these new ways of storing information that persists here now. We could store state information there, but that's not RESTful. The REST approach is to move it here. Well, now we have to worry about security and other issues, but that's what it means to build a hypermedia application. Great question. Love that question. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.